Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in emerging technologies, digital assets, the regulatory landscape, and capital markets. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, and joining me on the desk at the NASDAQ Market Site in Times Square, New York City, we have Peter Thomasic, co-founder and president of TensorWave, Melissa Mulholland, CEO of Crayon, Alex Walden, CEO of Riverica, and Vlad Pachenko, co-founder and CEO of Portal.ai. We're here to discuss why robust privacy policies, governance, stringent encryption standards, and compliance with global data is necessary for being successful in a company's AI journey. It is great to have all of you with us. Welcome to Trade Talks, welcome to Market Site. Let's go around the table here. Peter, we'll kick it off with you. Where are you seeing the key opportunities with AI applications? Yeah, what we see is uh, a lot of enablement of uh, employees being able to basically create new skill sets overnight that they didn't have before. Um, enabling them with these new generative AI tools is really uh, an incredible feat. And uh, you know, instead of putting people through training, they can think through more creative processes rather than iterative, you know, work. Right. And Melissa, it's interesting, AI is nothing new to all the companies sitting around the table here, but now that Gen AI has entered the consumer vernacular, it really does open up opportunities. Absolutely. I think, you know, Crayon's been in the AI business for 10 plus years, and we were doing even what you would say generative AI, generative AI before it was even a topic. But now I think the expediency of all companies, the relevancy, everybody now understands what AI needs. And so there's this real, I think, desire to go to market to create business efficiency and productivity faster than ever. And I think that there's a real opportunity to really take those solutions to market much faster than we did even two, three years ago. Yeah, and, and Alex, it almost seems as if, you know, Moore's Law, <laughs> technology begets technology. Where are you seeing the opportunities when applying these newer emerging technologies? <coughs> I'm, I'm sort of thinking Gen AI made it mass compatible because everyone now got what AI is, but the opportunities I really think we should fosters giving people access to things more easily, like in hospitals where you can do your x-rays and your MRTs quicker, because you don't need that human capacity anymore. And again, it's about building trust in that AI, a thing in general, and I think that's where the opportunities lies, is, is to take something that makes it mass understandable, but then actually add value to the human society or the individual. Yeah, I think that's going to be the key to the success. It's a bit cheesy, but. Well, not, not <laughs> cheesy, I mean, everything, is, it's all about data, Vlad, at the end exactly. of the day. There's just exactly. so much data, and more data begets data. Yeah, well, uh, in 2024, uh, like, the amount of data uh, for uh, humans to process, put together, and make effective the job or the business is uh, close to impossible. It requires uh, so many people, so much time, so uh, lots of methodologies. But one of the things which AI, I'm sure, is going to lead the way, is processing the data in a way that we can consume and make decisions or have answers on millions of questions we have in our head and to drive the passion. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there's kind of this old adage with, you know, newer startups and so fast move move quickly and break things. I don't think that's necessarily applicable here because privacy, I mean, trust is everything. Oh, yeah. Trust is something uh, all the companies strive for. You can lose it only once and it's very hard to get it and you either have it or not. But um, I really hope, especially with, with how we're approaching, and we are, I mean, not even our company, but I've seen other examples, uh, the data privacy in uh, the AI world with the zero knowledge architecture, with splitting the data and tokenizing it and not even sharing the private parts of the data between each other, that's gonna be a real life changer. And on a human perspective, it uh, feel, makes me feel safer along the way. Yeah. It, it, Melissa, do you think that perhaps applications are going to market too quickly, whether it's you know publicly facing or within the enterprise itself, and there's not enough um, risk or governance in place just yet? Yes, I believe so. I think there's a real opportunity that's going to change the landscape that we see today, but on the opposite side, there's also equal amount of risk. Because data, I think data privacy, data integrity are fundamental to really making sure you administer these models correctly. I think there's a lot of naivety around there still where people aren't putting necessarily the right policies and procedures and quality assurance in place, where that really then erodes the trust that is so fundamental uh, to these models in the first place. So I think, you know, looking at it in Europe, they're really taking a lead around the AI Act and making sure that there are structural policies and governance in place. I think that that's 
quite important. We've taken a lead in the sense that we recognize this early on. And even in some cases, we have to say no to engagements or projects because if it doesn't align to our ethical standards, and I think really making sure that we solve for the, prob for the business problem at hand, then we're also not going to be able to deliver to what is our core values and the company uh, and building that trust. And that's a great point that Melissa brings up, Alex. Sometimes you don't necessarily have to invest in certain areas of the tech stack unless there's a problem that you're looking to specifically solve. Right? You want to be very deliberate with this <coughs> type of technology. I think you want to tell the users that you're using AI and then you want to give a user the opportunity to find out why AI made a certain decision or gave you a certain suggestion. Mm -hmm. And for that one you need data observability and lineage and governance and all of these things in place. And I have some data to uh, support that because uh, we rolled out the product which uh, gives our customers uh, actionable advices mm -hmm. and uh, for the first like it takes them seven days or even less, but not more than seven days, and I'm talking about thousands of customers, when they want the explanation, they click explain the whole explanation why the decision was made for them to accept, but mm -hmm. uh, like most after seven days, don't even ask, they just accept, right. that's it. And that's an interesting element because you don't need to store that the whole time, you just need to store it maybe for two weeks, and then worst case, have a way of kind of redistilling it. Right. So, so what happens? To the data, then? Uh, uh, the data, uh, for, uh, first of all, the data is not stored anymore. And secondly, that they're not even asking for the data. So they don't need it. They accept uh, the outcome and not even asking how, what, uh, how uh, we got it and uh, not asking about the algorithm or how AI was getting to it. So uh, that sounds counterintuitive to me, Peter. Yeah, um, trust. one of our core uh, principles are safety, security, and trust. At Tensway, we enable companies like yours with uh, GPUs and CPUs, and uh, we make sure that we know, you know, whether it be physically air gapped from other customers or what paths uh, different data take through our systems. We want to be able to report that out, not only to our customers but to their end consumers. It's very important that people understand yeah. what's happening with Apple their data. Apple started a very good, in a very good way when. Uh, they tokenize the data, and this is exactly how we do, and we probably should all do. They tokenize the data, and the decision uh, is made on the side of the customer, and the data of the customer stays on his own private device. What is moving to us as a company is already some requests split to requests. We don't know why the user is requesting some of the things, and they're combined back on his own private device, so the data is not even leaving it. Yeah. Melissa, what about, I mean, the tech stack is just so big right now, and then you have to also manage third-party risk and, you know, the supply chain within that. Um, do you, are, are there too many touch points? I think there, there is a, you could say yes. Right. There are too many vast touch points, but I think it comes back to the point around data governance, data hygiene, mm -hmm. and really ensuring that, I'd say that problem statement is really refined with the customer at the beginning and then backing into it and making sure they have a solid data platform. Of course, there are third party aspects to this that have to be emerged. I mean, we've seen that today, um, you know, with all the cyber attacks that we see. Cybersecurity is a critical element to infusing into any AI and data practice that we see um, around the world. I think the two are really intrinsic and quite critical to one another. And that's why I was asking if these products are being rushed without assessing or back testing enough when it comes to risk and, and cybersecurity. I, that's intangible, it's really hard to place a value around your brand in that respect. Absolutely, I think quality assurance is vital because it's not just, at the end of the day, these models are human led. Yes, generative AI and ML algorithms, large language models take on a life of their own, but there is a human that needs to be involved in the process. And I think that's something that we can underestimate. So making sure that you have procedures in place, reducing bias and risk in, ter in terms of how we view and perceive the world. All of these elements need to be factored in. So I think this is the sort of like the governance and the structure that must be put in place from the top down within companies to make sure that that trust is adhered to, so that you really build scalable solutions that, you know, at the end of the day right. will add value. So Alex, let's talk about that in, in terms of building the structure around it because not only do you have to worry about you know data governance certain industries have different restrictions and regulations let's take financial services as an example we're one of the most heavily monitored industries with all the reporting and so forth but then you also have jurisdiction diversity as well because you're all operating in a global environment so how do you i mean you have i would imagine you have to be flexible somewhere within that structure it's almost like you need to define a catalog of the 
smallest common denominator and then work from there to what is applicable in a certain country. Also, it's almost like you have to define why they are doing it. So I'm from Germany and we take a very conservative approach to new things. Everything takes twice as long as for the Americans to be adopted, just because we need proof and evidence. <laughs> and I think, yeah, we have to take that into consideration when we build these models is who are we doing it for and why are we doing it? And my takeaway from the past is if there's a clear value to the end user or the customer, it is quicker to be adopted. Like you install a social messaging service on your phone, you need to say, do this, do that. Everyone does it because they have an immediate value. If you do something that doesn't have that, yeah, then maybe, you know, maybe, yeah, it becomes harder. Yeah. I mean, there certainly isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. I mean, as an example, we are a tech company at NASDAQ, but at the end of the day, we're an exchange as well. So there are certain apps that we can't use here in the US, we can only use, of course, say our Apple messaging app because of our security protocols, whereas it could be different for our counterparts elsewhere or you know competitors within this space. So it really is an individual solution. Correct, and you add in a couple of geopolitical right. animosities where suddenly TikTok, I understood, wasn't that popular in the US anymore, where it was still popular in Europe. It's popular. <laughs> well, it, well it's popular, popular, just not popular. like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know, travel to China and suddenly you can't use Google or WhatsApp anymore and you need to VPN out. But then again, everyone uses a VPN to use it. Yeah. Then it becomes kind of security for nothing. And that's also what you have to consider in, in any of these frameworks. How could people circumvent it and still keep using your system? Yeah, it's almost like you're playing 4G chess <laughs> all it the is. time, Peter, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah it, it, as we discussed, uh, it's, uh, it's a usual triangle with the uh, cost time and quality. So, uh, Triangle of horror, I call it. <laughs> well, uh, uh, you know, with the large language model, you know, we've surpassed the time when we could do something at the ground zero level, like to align on the, like, I don't know, moral values, because everyone rushed to the market. But there is a chance to put something in writing in Europe or here to at least govern a little bit and put in place the data and how it is, and it is not exchanged because uh, it could go and it will go wild with AI very, very soon. But Vlad, you also want to be impartial as well, Ooh. right? Yeah, I do, I do, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a serial entrepreneur, so right. I go run fast and I break things. But I'm a human being as well, so I don't like uh, my privacy to be traded. And we have a chance to change that now and at the same time be build beautiful things, so. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting. I'm just imagining this conversation, Peter, perhaps three, five years from now, and yeah. what it could look like. I mean, we were talking off camera before just how fast deep fakes, as an example, when we, they were introduced to us just a couple of years ago, I never thought they'd be where they are right now. Yeah, it's, it's crazy how fast it's been moving. Um, l l lending into what Alex was saying, um, we, we've taken a step beyond just lowest common denominator. We want to make sure, uh, to your point, um, a lot of our team comes from the finance industry, and we're trying to bring the standards up to at least a PCI DSS level to make sure that everything is encrypted at rest. Um, we, we only have one chance to gain the trust of the global population with you know, AI, and so uh, we're taking a very slow and measured approach from an infrastructure perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we want to enable you know, entrepreneurs like Vlad in a you know, safe well, I way. Mean, I personally agree with that type of solution. I, I mean, everyone is equating this to how the internet revolutionized the way that we did, you know, from the mid 90s to think about where we are right now. You can't operate without it. And if that assumption is AI is gonna be the same way, do you necessarily have to rush? If, if this is a technology that's not a fad and, and you know, could be the next internet. I don't um, think you have to rush necessarily. I think we start, we see that today with, you know, let's say generative AI tools like ChatGPT and Copilot. So Copilot is a good example where there was so much hype around putting AI into the modern work infrastructure, but there's a lot of testing right now because companies are trying to assess, one, the cost to fund it, but also just the use case around how are they going to create efficiency and how are they going to educate you know, their employees to make use of this AI technology that's just you know, at their PC. So I think there's an ele element of adoption and change management, mm -hmm. management that's absolutely fundamental as well to the common day-to-day -day person. So there's you know, the, the models that we go and build that are customized to a specific customer industry, but then there's also the mass 
just population of human society. And I think that is going to take some time for adoption, um, even despite the massive amount of hype, uh, as the tools and the productivity gets smarter. I would support that with the German engineering genius side. It will be driven by the outcome. Mm -hmm. So whenever we have the real ethics, like just say yes and it's going to happen and AI yeah, did it for you, the adoption is going to be wild. Like with just the chat GPT and tens of millions of users over months, this is how it's going to happen. Well, I have a question. It might be a little bit elementary. We were testing with one of the generative AI platforms that we have here. And we put in a question, how did the markets perform in July 2024? Recap made sense, then they broke it down by sectors. Like, this doesn't look right, the indexes aren't where they're supposed to be, but it was the data from 2023, even though the, the written out version was correct. When do you think those type of hallucinations will, I mean, that seems kind of basic, I mean, it's, it's basic data. When though those types of hallucinations are gonna be um, evaded, I think a year or two, but you can build a product now without hallucinations to just use that LLM in the proper way. Right, so then you would, you would use a specific data set and implement it into... I will use a specific right. data set and I, I will use another like two runs of another data set just to check out the outcome and only then present it to you. And, and that's why I don't think you're going to lose the, the editorial or creative side with a human. Sure. No, I would just but use but AI. Leaning into it, yeah. um, a lot of the devices, especially on the NVIDIA side, don't have enough uh, onboard memory to have a long enough context to capture what you're worried about here. and. Uh, you know, we're bringing AMD GPUs to market that have at least 4x as much uh, onboard memory and uh, have some products in place now that cut down on hallucinations almost 100% uh, yeah. in the form of long context caching. Yeah, I, I mean, so. look how fast it's evolved since what, November yeah. 2022 mm -hmm. is when it kind of became part of our vernacular, if you will. Yeah, yeah. but if you remember JetGPT when it came about, it was like three, four months old data. And if you ask it any recent, it had to hallucinate mm -hmm. and make it up. And that's where we see from a technical perspective how people train their models. Is it batch data that's old or is it real-time data that's kind of new? And that's where we are seeing our positioning in, the, in, in helping companies train their models at right time. Because mm -hmm. it can be trained with old data, but then you need to update it. Right. All the time. And, and, and Melissa, at the end of the day, this is why it all comes back to data. It does. It all comes back to data. It's the foundational oh, layer. Yeah. And most companies don't have the right data infrastructure, data platform in place, or even just the, let's say, harnessing and wrangling the data in a way that is proper. So I think this is a really key area that really needs to be, I think, sorted out. Um, and we see it today. I mean, if you look at just the generative AI platforms out there, there's so many. Um, it's all harnessing through data. So. It's fundamental, I think, to the future of where we are going. Um, and we all, as consumers, it's, we live and breathe off of data today. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to add to that one because personal experience working with data in, in different companies over many years is we look at AI, we look at the great tech, but we forget about data quality. Yes. I don't know, the amount of companies I've worked at where I had to look at some data warehouses and I had four data warehouses for the same topic. None of them gave me the same number. Yes. Now, how should I trust the data swamp that I have in my company? Mm -hmm. well, that's a governance issue. That's a governance and data lineage mm -hmm. and of, yeah, kind of Algorithm. observability again, where you make sure that what you have as data actually makes sense. Because that is the starting point. I can give you wrong data and come to the wrong decision, and then we are blaming AI for it. No, the data was yeah. wrong. Most yeah, of yeah, the yeah. time, the data is wrong. Most of the time. Yeah. So most uh, when like I've seen different approaches and different results and different products. You know, when we uh, reverse engineered them, like it wasn't the problem of AI, it was yeah. the problem of the data of input. The data going in. So the first thing you check is the data, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then you can blame AI. So. Right. Appreciate everyone's insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks, and thanks Thank for you. joining me for Market Site and Jill Malandrino, global markets reporter at Nasdaq.